Hey fellow trumpeters on YouTube, this is another episode of uh, Tips and Tricks with me, Charlie Porter, your trumpet playing host. Uh, I wanted to go over in this video something that I like to call the three compressions. Now trumpet players have lots of different ways that they explain how they play the trumpet and you know how they use the diaphragm and how they blow and how they uh, use the lips and how they use the tongue and you know it can be really perplexing actually reading all these different methodologies and all the terminologies that people use and I, I actually like to think that pretty much everybody's onto something anybody that can play well and has a method book um, or any great teacher who's known to have really excellent students you know things that they're saying they all make sense and they all fit into the equation of what we need to be doing um, but I think it can all be boiled down really simply into three compressions um, and if we think about trumpet playing in a more of a simple manner, then it's a lot easier to get good results. Uh, if we think about it as being super complicated, then good results uh, are much further away. It's like, I like to think, um, if you're trying to explain someone um, how, to, how to walk, for example, a baby. If you're trying to tell a baby how to walk, and you're telling them every little movement that they need to do, um, well, th their success rate is going to be very low. However, if they realize that they need to get from point A to point B, and number one, that's the main thing, the concept of, of why they need to walk, right? Um, they, they start to realize how to do it, but through very, very simple imaginative thinking. They copy, they see something, they copy it. Now, trumpet playing is not so easy in that respect. I think that we do need to have a little bit of information, but again, not too much information. Too much information can hurt us, and in fact, if we know the basics in terms of this, this information, all the other stuff, the, the other little pieces of information start to make sense on their own, right? We need to ask ourselves uh, why we need to do certain actions, not necessarily how to do every single one of those actions. If we know the whys, then the whys provide the hows, okay? Now I'll explain that um, in a little bit. But to start off with, let's, let's think about these three compressions. Compression number one, is the source blowing your the air right releasing the air from the breath that we take we have to take a good breath that's part of number one okay and people have all kinds of uh diatribes and, and information on uh you know how to take a proper breath but i like to think that you take a breath like you would when you're about to yell at someone hey right when we do that we don't even have to think twice we take a really great breath Right? We are, we're all masters of taking awesome breaths. We do this every day. Or when we yawn, for example. Right? Shoulders don't raise up. We take a nice, deep, relaxed breath. So that's the kind of breath we need to take. All right? But upon taking that breath, when we release the air, this is known as compression number one. Right? When I take in that breath, there we go. That's it, folks. Compression number one. I release the air. My lungs held in a certain amount of that compression. Right? My diaphragm was helping also to release uh, the air after my lungs natural compression faded so bam the air was expelled from my body through the use of the compression of the lungs and uh, and the compression of the diaphragm <sighs> now we can let that out quicker we can let it out slower so compression number one has a limited range of how compressed the air can be if I use the diaphragm quite a lot <sighs> then I can let out the air with a lot of compression and a lot of speed. If I let it out slower, okay, now I'm using less compression of the diaphragm. Okay, so compression number two, what is compression number two? Well, well, first of all, let's go back to compression number one. Compression number one, if I'd like, I like to liken things, uh, this, this, uh, these three compressions to that of a garden hose, okay? So when we turn on the spigot, the valve, to the garden hose, we're releasing the air through that uh, hose, right? We're turning on from the source, the water. So let's think of number one, the compression number one, you know, the, the air from the source of the lungs, right? As being likened to that of turning on the, uh, the water spigot. We're letting the water run through. Okay, now that we've done that, let's go on to number two. Compression number two is very similar to if you take that water hose and we take our thumbs and we squeeze the water hose, what happens? Well we're narrowing the passageway that the water can travel through that hose, right? By narrowing that passage, let's say it's here when we start, we, we narrow it down to this, right? By pressing our thumb against that hose, 
Now all of a sudden that water, what happens as it passes through the hose? We've all experienced this before. We don't have a nozzle, so we have to find a way to crimp the hose or, or squeeze it with our thumb. Well, now the water's going to shoot out because it's going faster. Is more water going through there? Nope. We didn't change the source at all. We didn't ch put more water, uh, right? We, we didn't change that. All we're doing is we're simply making the air go, uh, sorry, making the water go through the hose faster by pressing on it with our thumb. Now what's the, uh, the, the, the same thing that we can do for the trumpet, right? The analogy is using our tongue, right? For the trumpet player, we can't use the thumb for the air, but we can use our tongue. Uh, inside the mouth, let's go back to compression number one. If we're just blowing air, not using the mouth or the lips or anything, um, now let's provide a little resistance to that air, a little compression, right? And the way we can provide a lot of compression um, and have a lot of control over compression is the thumb, right? But in this instance, it's our tongue. So if I go, ah, and then I slowly raise it to an e, e, you can hear the air speed up drastically, right? It's the same principle. Now let me show you a close-up of what that looks like. Notice that the cavity is wide. Notice that I'm making, by raising my tongue, a small cavity, right? And, and the, the cavity um, or the tubing, right, which is my mouth, that funnel, is getting smaller. Okay, so believe it or not, this is a huge way as trumpet players that we control uh, the pitch of the instrument, right? Just like when we whistle. Now the tongue is raising and coming forward. The motion is not exactly going up and down. It's kind of raising and coming forward in the mouth. Aye. And if we, any of us can say aye, and you'll feel that. This is compression number two. Okay, let's go on to compression number three. On the garden hose, compression number three would be what? It would be the nozzle, right? The tip of, of, of the, uh, if, if you don't know what a nozzle is, um, it's the tip of the hose where you can screw it in and it's going faster because the hole closes or you can unscrew it and then the hole opens and then the water just kind of falls out, right? So when we have the nozzle open, more water comes through so the speed is less but the quantity is greater, right? And again, we're not changing source number one, the spigot or let's say the blow from the lungs, right? So when we, when we uh, tighten that nozzle, now there's less water going through, but there's more of it going through, right? There, uh, sorry, there's less water going through, but there's more speed, right? It's going through faster. That's why when we tighten the nozzle, the speed is enough to make that water shoot out and hit a target that we'd like to, to, to hit. Whether it's, you know, a little kid trying to hit their brother with a hose, or whether we're trying to, uh, to water a plant that's, you know, uh, all the way on the other side of the garden. Um, so, in terms of trumpet playing, when do we want to do this, you know, and, and what, is, what is the nozzle for us trumpet players? Well, let's talk about the nozzle for the trumpet player. The nozzle for the trumpet player, you probably guessed it already, it's the embouchure. More specifically, the lips w uh, which, which form the aperture, right? The aperture itself is the nozzle. Now, contrary to some players' beliefs, you do not need to form a smaller, uh, uh, a smaller aperture by doing this with the lips. Right? Doing that with the lips actually ends up cutting off your, your air supply. Right? We're trying to get air to go through the lips, but trying to get it to go through the lips faster. Right? So the way we control this compression, the third compression, which is the nozzle or the aperture control. Uh, by the way, the second one was called tongue control, tongue level control. But the third one is called aperture control. Uh, and the way that we control this is simply, and, I, and I've mentioned this in another video actually, um, called the, the direct line approach. Uh, you know, to, to get from point A to point B. If you haven't watched that video, that, that will help you once you understand the concepts in this video um, in terms of playing from note to note on the horn. But let's get back to the third compression. Uh, I'll stop plugging my other video. So basically, what we're trying to do uh, with, with the lips is make a smaller nozzle. How do we do that? Well, if we think making a smaller nozzle with the lips, we're going to be in, uh, in trouble right away because most people automatically, they go, they close off their lips, right? And to some extent, this will work. I'm not saying that it won't work. If we play the trumpet that way, right? Now, I can get up there. It's going to make me get up there, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a very small sound, and it's going to cut off 
the air supply and, and the notes are going to be squeaks and from the low to the high range there's not going to be equality of sound because the vibrating material, the surface here, is changing radically. Uh, to show you this in a visualizer, um, give me one second, I've got to find where this visualizer is. To show you this in the visualizer, okay, make sure that this is focused enough. You see, I put the mouthpiece on, I set the lips, I set the aperture. As I go from low to high, that does not change. The opening in the middle, the aperture does change. The aperture control changes. Now what makes it change? I'm, I'm not doing this. Notice how that time I was feeding my lips inward. I was doing this with my lips. I was curling them in, right? Which does make the whole change, right? But the, the correct way, the way I did it first was like this. I noticed that the, the lips relatively stayed in the same place. The contact point of the rim stayed in the same place on the lips. Okay, so uh, that I call that aperture control. The way that we get this aperture control is it's very simple. Instead of thinking of the lips, we think of the air that we're blowing. So um, to go back to my cooling soup thing that I like to, to say all the time to my students, cool soup, right, when we do that, that gives us a nice open aperture, right? Something more along the lines of, uh, of a nice low note on the trumpet. Okay, so actually I'm gonna shut off this air conditioner because I think it's probably making noise uh, on the video. Hopefully that wasn't too much noise so far that you can understand everything I'm saying. Okay, so uh, now with that shut off, I'm gonna blow that air like I'm cooling soup. Now, in order to change from that nice wide aperture, which I'm thinking uh, in terms, I'm thinking if I had to think of a size Airstream, I'm thinking about a, an Airstream the size of say a Sharpie pen, right? If you don't know what a Sharpie is, okay, I'll grab one. This guy right here. So think of an Airstream about that size, right? And then notice that the aperture is nice and wide and open. That's, those are low notes on the trumpet, right? And that's, I'm controlling the aperture uh, like opening the nozzle, right? So, bam, a lot of air can come through. It's not going to go through very fast. Now, if I speed up that air, how do I speed up the air? Well, by tightening the nozzle. How do I tighten the nozzle uh, with the aperture? The way I do this is by thinking of a small uh, airstream, a pin size, a needle size airstream. When I do that, notice that automatically, without even thinking of it, all the muscles do what they need to do. Uh, they, the muscles are still gripping here, but the muscles on the inside grip uh, smaller and the, and the nozzle closes up. Now let me show you that again. I'm going to transition from wide nozzle to small nozzle, okay, or wide aperture to small aperture, okay. And all these I would say, um, just to, to pause for a second, there are people that are, belong to an, a, a closed embouchure school and an and a open embouchure school, right, or open aperture school and closed aperture school. Again, the way I teach is I include all of these things. I don't believe in one or the other. I believe that the aperture should be as open as it can be for the note that you're on. However, having too open of an aperture uh, on a certain high note is going to be problematic. You're going to be killing yourself, right? So for every uh, note that you play, there's, there's a specific aperture setting. And you can be very high on that setting, or you can be very low on that setting. To be more open on each one of those settings is going to be preferable because it's going to give you uh, a bigger sound, right? And it's going to give you more relaxation in terms of how that sound uh, resonates. And, and it will be a more resonating sound. Okay, so let's go back to that transition from wider aperture uh, with slower air to a faster aperture with faster, sorry, to a smaller aperture with faster air. Um, here we go. So I'm going to start wide and slow. 
thinking of a Sharpie and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the uh, pin sized one. I'm going to do this a couple times so you can see the transition. Notice by the way that the face muscles here stay relatively the same. Now notice that this is different than if I was to do this with my lips. Right? I'm drastically changing the vibrating material, the point of the vibration of the lips, right, by pushing them in and rolling them in this way um, in order to make a smaller aperture. But as I just showed you, that is not necessary to make a smaller aperture. Okay, so with these three different things, these three different compressions, they're going to govern all of your trumpet playing. They will allow you to play loud, uh, soft, low, high, and all the stuff in between. Um, now, if we can think of, there's other compressions. You might be saying, wait, wait, I got some other ways that I can compress the air. Well, there's some negative ways of compressing air that I strongly um, would suggest that you would try to avoid. Okay, these ways of, of compressing the air include, well, you probably guessed it, pressure, right? If we press against the aperture, this is a false way of closing up the aperture. Right? With the nozzle, right, we use the, the control of the nozzle mechanism to make it from large to small back to large again. And as you see here, there's nothing pressing on my lip to make it go from slow and wide to fast and small. Right? However, if we were to, and I'll prove this to you using the, uh, the visualizer, if we were to set up our embouchure with a certain uh, aperture size setting. Now, I'm not going to change anything with my lips in terms of thinking of smaller airflow or, or larger airflow. I'm going to simply press the mouthpiece, or the visualizer in this case, harder against my lips. And what's going to happen, um, Penzarella, Vince Penzarella, if you don't know him, a uh, great trumpet teacher, used to play uh, with the, the Philharmonic, New York Philharmonic. He talks about something called the donut uh, analogy, right? Now, if you take a donut and you place it between two plates of glass and you squeeze it together, and for the, those of you that don't know what a donut is, if you're watching over uh, in another country outside the U.S., a donut is uh, one of the pastries we eat in America and it's got a hole in the middle of it, right? So if you're squeezing this donut in between two plates of glass, what happens to that hole in the middle of the donut? Well, the mass of that donut has nowhere to go as we're squeezing it except for inward in the middle because there's that space in the middle so it's going to close up right so naturally uh if we press on that donut between two hard surfaces let's now let's think of this an analogously to to us as uh, human beings we have hard teeth and we have an equally hard surface of the mouthpiece when we're squeezing the lip the lips uh and the aperture in between those two hard surfaces it's ex exactly the same thing as a donut the middle part is going to close up and you guessed it, folks, that aperture is going to get a lot smaller. But this is a limited uh, way of, of getting to higher notes on the trumpet for several reasons. One of the most important reasons, it hurts after a while. Um, uh, another reason, there's a cap on how high you can go. You can only press so much. Okay. Uh, number three, you can damage your lips this way. By pressing on them repeatedly this way, uh, you can actually cut your lip, you can sever your orbicularosaurus. There's a lot of nasty things that could happen by pressing too much. Um, plus, number four, you don't get as nice of a sound because you're abusing the vibrating material, right? Just like a drum. If you uh, take the head of a drum and you touch it anywhere uh, uh, on the drum head while you're trying to play it, and if you were to press into that drum head, with a lot of force, it won't resonate the same way. It won't be as free, the resonation. Uh, uh, the resonating tone will not be as free. Uh, by the way, these videos are always off the cuff. I don't have scripts, so if I make mistakes here and there with the words, you just gotta uh, give me that, uh, that leeway because, you know, I'm, tr I'm trying to just get this information out in as natural as a way as possible as if I was sitting right there with you. Okay, so now let's go back to this. We're talking about, um, you know, what I was about to show you was an example of if I use more pressure, you're going to see that hole close up, just like in the donut example. So here we go. I'm not going to do it with my lips. I'm going to do it by pressing.
Now I'm exerting a good amount of pressure when I'm doing that. You can see that it looks awfully similar to this when I do this. I'm, now I'm going to do it using my airflow. I set my aperture when I, when I make them, when I set the mouthpiece and I go into this in, in depth on my second embouchure video. Um, so if you want to watch that one, it's, uh, it's actually, I, I explain how to set the, the lips up in depth using the visualizer and making the space for the aperture. So I'm not going to go into too much depth except to say that when I set up, I do create a certain space right there, which is the aperture. Okay. Now what determines whether that aperture gets bigger or smaller is the tension of the lips. Okay. What determines the tension of the lips is my concept of how wide or small that air is. Okay. Just like we did before without the mouthpiece. When you think of a wide airstream, you don't have to think about the tension of the lips. They automatically release and let more air come through. If we think about a small airstream, like a pin sized needle airstream, we don't have to think about the tension of the lips. They automatically do what they need to do to make the right size airstream go through there. So when I do that on the mouthpiece or the visualizer, now right now I'm just blowing air. If I was to add in a little bit of extra compression with my lips, which you have to do when you're playing with the lips alone or even with a mouthpiece, because the, the trumpet requires uh, less compression than lips alone. The, uh, the mouthpiece requires less compression than the trumpet. Or sorry, more compression than the trumpet. It's basically, uh, to sum that up, if you're playing with, if you're buzzing with the lips, they have to be closer together because there's no air pressure in the room, right? Or there is, but it's very, very little compared to the pressure that's inside of the trumpet. And then with the mouthpiece, you don't have to, to, to put the lips quite as close together because you have a little bit of resistance or compression uh, built into the shank here. So consequently, if I take off the lips, you're not going to see buzzing happening. Right? Now on the trumpet, it requires even less compression uh, of the lips because there's all this air compression uh, built into the horn, which is feedback. When you're blowing into, uh, into the horn, that air meets the air that you're blowing and it creates a standing wave, which creates uh, the buzzing, right? So if I was to do that and show you, and you know, I showed you this in, in my first video on embouchure, which is simply that in order to get a sound on the trumpet, in fact, a good sound, you don't have to compress the lips very much. Okay, sorry for that little rant, but now going back to showing you uh, on the visualizer. Now, if I add that extra compression in and make the aperture smaller, then I'm succeeding in going to higher notes, uh, going back and forth between low and high with the aid, not of pressure, but of the good compression, which is using the aperture. Okay, so that was one bad way of compressing, which is forcing. We saw how that works. If we use pressure, we can, uh, we can essentially make the, the small part of that donut, the, the center of that donut, close up. Okay, which is in essence making a smaller nozzle, which makes everything go faster through that hole. Okay, so we want to avoid that. Another one you want to avoid is throat compression. A lot of times you'll hear players play and they'll have this grunting sound in their throat. And that's caused because there's too much tension in the throat, right? If I was to play... Now listen to that sound. It's very, it's very constricted. All I'm doing there, I'm playing with a fine embouchure, but, but what I'm doing here is causing my throat to be very tight. You want to make sure that the throat is not compressing. Uh, the air. Some people actually do use the throat to compress the air to get higher. And as they go higher, they, uh, they might not hear it, but the person next to them will hear grunting happening. Um, some people also have problems with this throat stuff happening when they're tonguing. Um, and that might be because they're blocking the air too much with the tongue. Air doesn't have anywhere to go. So where does it go? It goes back into your body, right? And your throat tightens up. This also happens if your aperture is too closed, right? If the air can't get out, if you go to play, Right, and the air's not getting through there, what's going to happen? The air that you're trying to blow out, it's going to come back and it's going to make your throat tense, right? Um, some people even have bulges that happen in their throat where 
it does that, right? And that shouldn't necessarily happen unless you're really playing and exerting a lot of force, like maybe if you're Maynard Ferguson and you're playing up on a, on a double high C, loud as hell, right? Then maybe that can happen. Okay, so let's go to some other forms of bad compression. Um, you'll see the people that play with the smile embouchures, right? You take a balloon, you, we all know this analogy, squeeze the balloon uh, this way, right, the opening, what happens? The vibrating material thins out, just like we know on a, on a stringed instrument, the, the higher pitch strings are smaller. They're made of thinner material, they vibrate at a higher pitch. Wider strings, or look at a piano, the wider strings vibrate at lower pitches. Same with our lips. If we stretch the lips as we go higher, we will, I mean, if we stretch the lips, we will be able to go higher. But again, this has a cutoff. This has an absolute cap. You can only do that so much and you can only thin out the lips so much. And by the way, as you're doing this, it's going to require you to press more as well. You're going to have to do that donut effect as well. And guess what? When you press that hard on lips that are being thinned out, you can really hurt yourself. Um, I'll just show you this, what it looks like. So right there, I was doing this as I played and it was taking me up higher, but again, the sound is going to get thinner as you have this approach. Okay, um, there are many other more negative ways to, to, to add compression. You can do it by stretching too much up and down with the lips as well. It's just another way of, of compressing, um, not necessarily compressing, but stretching in that, in that regard, which has the same effect, right? It gives you a higher pitch, but not necessarily through using the three positive com compressions. So basically all you need is a good source of air, that's from the diaphragm, from the lungs, compression number one. Number two, tongue level control, saying ah, ee, ah, ee. this comes natural to most folks. Number three, this is the one that most folks kind of don't really get or they mess up. It's aperture control through a process of thinking about the size of the airstream that you want and maintaining the same embouchure setting on the mouthpiece. This is key. This is why certain, uh, certain things like Caruso really work if you do them the right way. Uh, in the Caruso method, he has you actually maintaining the same setting. This isn't to kill you. This is to show you that as you're going through the different register changes, that this does not need to change. If you change, if you make the lips go in and out, you're resetting, and this can be a lot harder uh, because you get off of the efficiency, right? If you stay in the same setting, then you don't need to make much change. The change is made right here in the very middle. And it's a lot easier once you get the coordination to change here than it is to be doing this kind of a change. And also the sound is better and it's unlimited. Okay, so that's how you get around the horn. Uh, now you might be saying, how do I combine these three compressions together? Well, that's a whole other story, right? Uh, once we know what these compressions are, we need to know how to use them. Well, I can say basically this. Number one, the first compression is only for dynamics, folks. If you're using that to go to the next highest note, then you're using it for the wrong uh, thing. So, for example, if I go... And by the way, I, I explained this a little bit uh, more in depth on my straight, uh, straight line or direct line approach. Uh, going from point, point A to point B. Uh, there's a video that I made on that called uh, the, the straight line approach, or, or was it the direct line approach? I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, going from G to C, if I do it with the air and I go, well, that is, you know, that's going to be one way to get the note out, but that's also a negative way of using that compression to go higher, right? Going higher does not require more air. It requires faster air, right? So, by utilizing compression number two and compression number three, we can get anywhere on the horn that we need to, uh, regardless of dynamics for right now. We're, done, we're not trying to uh, talk about dynamics just yet, because uh, compression number one is for dynamics. So let's leave that one alone. Number two and number three. Ah, right? If we were just to play a note on the horn, Okay, we play that note on the horn. I'm just changing ah to e. Ah, e, ah. It's making the note change. Now, if you're trying this and it's not working, you might not be doing the setting exactly in the right place. And that's okay. Uh, and if it does work, then you might notice, oh, hey, there's something to that. All I had to do was use my tongue. But that's really not enough. 
Um, the other thing that has to happen is the aperture, right? Now, if we were just to do that exercise of, of blowing wide airstream to a smaller airstream and going back and forth between those, that's another way you can do it on the trumpet. Even if I didn't move my tongue at all, what I'm doing right there is simply changing the aperture from wide to small by visualizing a wide airstream and a small airstream. Now if we combine those two together, and wide airstream to small airstream, back to wide airstream, So I can just get over the whole horn very easily, back and forth. Anyway, it's just a matter of controlling it with the aperture size. Um, so, but not, sorry, not just the aperture size, with the aperture size and also with the tongue. Okay, so when we're doing the tongue level combined with the aperture size, then we can get all over the horn very easily. How do we do this in a slow, methodical beginning approach? Well, let's take that note G to C. You're going to start that note, um, and what you're going to do is think of a wide aperture, a wide airstream, okay, and go to a small airstream. What's going to happen when we do that? Well, if we did it successfully, you kept your source the same. You didn't change the source. Because as you narrow in on the same source of air, that air ends up going faster, right? And as we said before, faster air creates higher notes. It doesn't create louder higher notes, but it creates higher notes, right? If we were to do the, the reverse, if we were to start on that C, very softly, or not softly, if we were to start on the C, um, softly, excuse me, with a small aperture setting, and we are to simply widen that setting, but not change the air. It appears as the lower note has gotten louder, as if we might have given it more air, but in fact, I didn't give it more air, I kept the same air, but I just changed the way I was compressing it. Okay, and with that, uh, the tongue was also moving. E -ah, e -ah. So what you need to do, folks, is, is, is figure out, just like learning a stick shift or something like that, coordination of how much of an ah to e you got to do and how much uh, of opening and closing the aperture you have to do. And I know this sounds mechanical. In fact, I know there's a lot of trumpet players out there thinking, oh, God, this guy is telling people what to do with their lips and with their tongues and... You know, the only reason I'm saying this stuff is because a lot of people have learned how to do this stuff the wrong way. And they're thinking, oh man, people are just telling me to use my air, or this, and blah blah blah. And you know, sometimes it's hard to get out of those traps of, of having bad habits unless you know how this is working. Alright, so that's the reason I'm giving you this video, is not to give you every single little detail of every muscle. I'm not talking about the buccinators, and the big larosaurus, and the lever, I'm not talking about all this stuff. That would be pointless. That is too much of a head trip, which is going to make us paralyzed. As uh, Bud Hurth said, said, if you uh, overanalyze, then it leads to paralyzation, right? Uh, analyzation leads to paralyzation, right? So if, if we think too much, then all of a sudden we don't even know how to play anymore. However, I believe that I'm giving you uh, the keys to really be able to think and control your destiny in terms of how you're using your air on the trumpet. Okay, so if we play that middle G, we know for sure that we have two ways of controlling to get to the next pitch. Um, and those two ways together offer us the best solution for navigating from low to high back to low. Here's the tongue level. Here's the aperture control. Here's both of them together. So as I'm going through this range, uh, you might see things happening here as well, thinking, oh, well, he's changing stuff with his lips and he's not talking about that. Well, anything that you see here happening on the outside 
is not th something that I'm thinking of consciously. It's in direct correlation to the airstream that I'm playing on the trumpet. So if I'm playing a wide, slow airstream, these muscles will not have to be as activated because there's less resistance coming out from my body. And remember that there has to be a balance between the air that you're blowing and the pressure that you're exerting on the horn. Uh, sorry, on your face, right? There's good pressure and there's bad pressure. If we have enough pressure to balance off the air that's coming out of the horn, then we get a homeostasis, we get a balance, we get the yin and yang of trumpet playing, right? As we play louder, there's more air coming out through the horn, which means we have to supply a little bit more pressure on the mouthpiece, right? This is not to be confused with pressing the mouthpiece in to get that donut hole to close, right? That effect. That's a very different thing. When we're playing higher, we don't need to use more pressure. However, if we're playing higher and louder, well now we have more force of air coming out behind the lips, wanting to blow them apart. And you might see a player, uh, as they're going higher and louder, louder uh, you'll see their lips start to really firm up. Okay, so just to start off, for you guys, um, once you understand what these three compressions are, the next thing to do is to learn how to utilize them to go from note to note. And that's where my next video comes in. So check out the uh, direct line or straight line approach to playing trumpet. Okay, and uh, I hope this has helped you. I'm Charlie Porter signing off. And uh, if, you, if you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe. There's more videos where this came from. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Take care.